some really great folks I'd like to introduce you to and bring bring up here to talk about their reflections, their thoughts on this, their and what implications for Los Angeles. So I'd like to bring up Kim Batillo Brownson, Vice President of Policy and Strategy for First Five LA, Veronica Carrizales, Policy and Campaign Development Director for California Calls, Roxana Molina, Chief in charge, Bureau of Program Policy, Los Angeles County Department of Public Social Services, and Tori Osborne, Principal Deputy for Policy and Strategy for Los Angeles County Supervisor Sheila Keel. And Tori is going to be our moderator and provocateur here, something she's done very well, and I'm sure you've seen her all do that here in the region a lot. We're honored that all these folks could join us here today. Um, thank you for putting up with me for the better part of the last 45 minutes, and I look forward to hearing from our panelists lot to do is to just lift up the incredible resource that we in California care about economic opportunity and low and middle income folks have in the California Budget Policy Center. I'm still adjusting to their new name. Really, honestly, this is a national treasure in our, our state. Um, to be able to track State budget, this huge state, the seventh largest economy in the world, to be able to track it with the finesse and the wisdom that these guys do every year is a huge gift to all of us who are trying to make sense of it, particularly in this uh, moment. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to hear from each person a little bit about how this a little uncertain, but how this budget uh, affects the work that they're doing in their um, uh, in their communities or in their organization, in their particular field. Um, I want to just uh, start out by saying a one is it's not just that we're early in the budget process. The federal budget hasn't been taken into account in the governor's budget, it's that we're in this radically changing new world order, okay? That both on the one hand, those of you who've been following the what President Trump is going to talk about tomorrow night, 10% increase in military budget, keeping Medicare and Social Security and cutting everything else, know that we are in for a bumpy ride. Um, I don't think there's been such coherence in a right-wing worldview and economic view in my lifetime. President Trump makes Richard Nixon with his um, proposed uh, base income, he actually called for a universal income, look like a socialist, and makes George W. Bush on immigration look progressive. So we're in this really terrifying kind of time with a coherent uh, worldview based on white supremacy and nationalism and authoritarianism. And then on the other hand, there's been this rising up of people and also, I hope we talk about, and I say it because the organizations you work with, the constituencies and communities that you work with that are going to be the most, that are already the most impacted by what's going on are in fact defying, I think, anything that any of us has ever seen in our lifetime. There's a kind of an equal and opposite rising up of democracy to just put it in the broadest terms. I don't think it's ideological. I think it's visceral. And I think it is going to change the conditions that we move forward on. Um, you know, who would have thought we would be talking about single payer uh, <laughs> in California right now? Well, we're talking about it because California is hell-bent in being in the lead of defying Trumpism, right? And because we and we have a governor who says we're going to build that damn satellite if they won't fund it, right? So he has he is in line with the leadership and the legislature and and the California kind of people rising up in defiance. Um, so I just want to put that 
out there because I don't think we've seen the end of either what Trumpism is going to do to the budget. You heard the numbers. It's pretty terrible. It's like 25% uh, if, if the cuts come from the feds of the state budget. And then on the other hand, uh, when people um, act differently out of the ordinary, it can change the conditions of, uh, it, it, can, it can limit what they can do, right? So anyway, I want to throw it open and we're going to hear a few minutes uh, from each person. Um, so why don't you just introduce yourself, give us a sentence about yourself, and then uh, who wants to go first? I'll go first. Okay, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Roxana Molina. I am the chief in charge of the Bureau and Program and Policy <laughs> for the Department of Public Social Services. So my section oversees all the programs that could potentially be cut if the budget goes through. Um, our biggest concern right now, obviously, as <laughs> everyone knows, is actually the two things that Chris identified. We're really looking at ACA because ACA did um, enhance or increase our number of Medi-Cal eligibles in our county. And then we're also looking at CCI because that was another um, big impact to our department. So overview quickly, we are you know, monitoring the uh, budget closely. We work very closely with LAO. We also have our own legislative um, analyst, Abaca Stay, who we work closely with. Um, and she's constantly keeping us updated. So hopefully, we are in a bumpy ride. We, we will definitely um, see a lot of bumpiness. Uh, the road is not smooth right now. And we're not sure when it will start getting smooth. But you know, my department, my department head, um, is committed to still doing the best services we can provide to the residents of LA County. Thank you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> I want to just say, since I work for the county for Supervisor Kuehl, the uh, CEO, Sachi Habai, has uh, is basically asking the department, because we're in budgeting um, mode at the county, to come up with 3%, 5%, and 7% cuts. And this is just simply, this is really nothing to do with um, contingency planning on the ACA, because that will probably hit next year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about IHSS, the $220 million that the county would lose if the state, uh, or would have to spend, uh, out of its general fund. So it's just that one piece of what Chris talked about. We're already in contingency planning of cutting, belt tightening. Um, Veronica? Sure. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Veronica Carrizales, and I'm the Policy and Campaign Development Director for California Calls. California Calls is a statewide alliance of community-based organizations that work predominantly with uh, low-income communities of color throughout throughout the state. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to be here today. I'm really excited. Uh, also really excited that Tori is our moderator because if you think about someone who's provocative, it's Tori. <laughs> and so, she, you know, so this is a, a great uh, opportunity for us. Uh, so when I think about uh, the state budget and you know what this means for low-income communities, um, not only does it, mean, does it mean a lot of uncertainties, it also means on a temporary basis, a lot of chaos, right? How many of us have now been looking at Twitter feeds regularly, now you know, been looking at emails and, and the news more regularly just to see the latest that's coming out of, uh, as Tori mentioned, uh, the new world order? Uh, we're, uh, as my colleagues have mentioned, uh, it's unclear about the fate of the Affordable Care Act. Um, as we know, it could leave millions of Californians without health care. Uh, if we move to state block grants, it could be it could be a loss of about $8 billion for California. Uh, on immigration enforcement, um, this could mean continuing to tear apart families uh, throughout California and especially here in Los Angeles. Uh, we're already, it could also mean higher numbers of children in the foster care system. We're already seeing uh, entire communities hunker down in fear as a result of the latest that has come out on immigration enforcement. Um, and we're seeing families keeping their children home from school uh, because of fear of deportation. Um, Tori mentioned uh, today uh, Trump announced uh, $54 billion in defense funding. 
and defense spending, um, and he would pay for it by cutting domestic spending and foreign aid, and he specifically mentioned uh, cutting the Environmental Protection Agency. So uh, on top of some of the attacks that we have already seen on, on the number of fronts that I've mentioned, we will continue to see attacks on women's rights, on the LGBT community, and around criminal justice reforms um, and advances that we have made here um, and throughout the country. The reality is that many poor families will suffer if these federal cuts happen, and the gap between the rich and the poor will continue to widen, right? Um, so uh, this is a time when we need to think about, we're in a very crucial moment, and I heard uh, Supervisor Kuehl talk about what can we do, and, and she talked about it in the way of, let's throw a monkey wrench. Let's throw a monkey wrench in the plans that uh, President Trump has. So we could see a loss of many of our progressive gains, um, and, we could, and we're, we could be in danger of moving back to constantly reacting to the cuts that are happening. And so that's why it's important that right now at this time, we throw a, runky, a monkey wrench in this, and we work not only on the defensive fight of resistance, which we have seen thousands of people participate in, but we also work on the proactive offensive fight of putting forward progressive policy solutions for California. Because California can and will continue to be a beacon of hope for the rest of the nation. So I have been tremendously inspired by the immigrant protests that have happened at the airport, which happened, you know, uh, some of my colleagues who were involved in organizing those, they happened in a drop of a dime. I have been tremendously inspired by the town halls and by, uh, by seeing our congressional leaders who have lost sight of what this means for our communities um, actually leave in fear <laughs> because you have uh, local residents who have been protesting. I have been tremendously inspired by the thousands of women who participated in the Women's uh, March. Uh, and so I think that we need to continue to work with policymakers. We need to continue to work with community-based organizations and with labor to think about creative solutions for California so that we can continue to advance progressive policy. Hi, my name is Kim Patillo Brownson. I'm the VP of Policy and Strategy for Five LA, which is a public grant maker and also a child advocacy organization. Um, I'm actually new in this role, um, and for about 10 years prior to that, I was a civil rights lawyer at Advancement Project, and so come to the early childhood work um, with the view that this is this is justice work, that this is progress work, that this is opportunity work. Um, what what is striking to me always whenever we, we dive into a conversation about the budget is it becomes, at a certain point, numbers on a page. And what it really is about is values and what we are choosing to prioritize and also deprioritize. Um, and so from, from my vantage, when I think about um, the, this next budget season, it's, there are very salient and real and pressing questions for working families about whether they're it is a value for the state of California for working families to be able to continue to be employed, whether it's a value for um, children who we know could benefit from early learning programs, who we know could benefit from early health programs, to actually be able to be a part of a prevention strategy, or whether we value instead that um, other things in the budget that continue to grow that were listed on Chris's slides will continue to grow at the expense of children and families. Um, the other thing that I'm clunking around in my brain is this idea um, of California being in this space right now of, of wanting to build a big blue wall around us um, and say no federal <laughs> policy shall penetrate. The one, one danger, I think, of that is that if, if we become too self-congratulatory and are only in a space of resist and oppose, we're actually losing sight of the progress that is actually still possible. Um, what, I, what I always think about whenever I see the revenue swings um, is that California has, on average, sort of about 10-year cycles of bust and boom. And we, we are now in a period still of the largest economic expansion, continuous growth that California has ever had in its history. What we're also seeing is that the economy is still growing. This is the single largest budget that California has ever produced in its history. And 
in a year when we are at record levels of growth and revenue for us to be so stingy, honestly, um, on the budget that we're talking about a pause. And I, I appreciate the quotation marks that Chris um, added to it because it, 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 is, it is a pause in name alone. It is a cut. It is a quarter of a billion dollars, which represents less than one one hundredth of a percent of the state budget that is the subject of extreme stinginess, I want to say. Um, it is 3,000 seats across the state. Um, it is health care providers who have been promised and built budgets, assuming that the governor would actually keep his word in last year's budget deal. Um, for the legislature, it was a bargain for fully publicly represented deal that was supposed to actually happen um, that there are Department of Finance documents saying that this is a multi-year de deal that the legislature accepted a lower number in last year's budget in order to have multi-year investments that the governor elected to flatline in this budget. And so when I think about what this means for values and what it means for our conversation with federal uncertainty, I think it's appalling that we can't find one one hundredth of a percent of the budget to actually get in gear and create a different model. But the, the danger, I think, is that I, I have been um, personally in my non-governmental capacity buoyed by some of the, the um, conversation from the governor and the legislature saying that we'll build our own satellite, that we will figure out um, a way to um, look into single payer, which was previously not on the table. But there isn't equivalent, there is no equivalent for children and families right now in terms of the conversation coming out of our executive branch. And that is, that is a space for mobilization, that is a space to actually be loud and to channel some of the energy and the visceral reaction that I think people are feeling um, to actually be clear about it's not enough to resist. It also has to mean that we build a positive view of what California is as an alternative. Um, and I think that's opening up interesting spaces um, of creativity, of urgency, of innovation to look at different tax mechanisms that haven't been on the table before. I want to follow up with what is actually happening to resist the governor's budget or to organize in case the revenues don't go up in the current situation and, and to try to make him perhaps hold to his word from the past or to fight him on some of these things in a minute. But I want to talk about the revenues issue. Um, and Veronica, talk a little bit about what the sort of current read on the situation is. In the last election, Californians passed, as best as I can tell, I don't know about every local measure, but every, certainly in LA County, we passed every tax and bond measure that was on the ballot. I mean, it was quite extraordinary. We didn't, we passed me Measure M, the county, we were thrilled about the transportation. The parks measure passed, everything passed, um, and it, it, it looked as if Californians were sending a message before we knew about the New World Order and Donald Trump, right? Putting them uh, of what the values were, that we care about public parks, that we care about public transportation, that we care about uh, back to uh, Prop 30 and so forth, that we care about and the explosive Prop 55, the extension, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then the criminal justice reform that had the, the 47 to 57 that have been passed. So it looked as if California's values were pretty widely shared at a level that was, you know, defied, I think, prediction. So in the new world order, where Californians are proudly standing up to a federal government on most of its repress repressive issues, at least the leadership is, the elected leadership is, and the grassroots are. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, what are people thinking about, about some of the tax measures that we've talked about, the sales tax extending to services, uh, the property tax reform split role, the Prop 13 reform, um, oil extraction tax is there a conversation that uh, looks at raising revenues to help advance uh, some of these things that are being underfunded, not just in this budget, but have been steadily decreasing? Yeah, um, and, and thank you for framing that. Um, 
if you look at the past several years, we've made significant gains in um, uh, in actually passing tax measures to raise more money for the homeless, to raise more money for education, um, to raise uh, to you know to develop more programs, um, and then across the state. Um, Communities have been nickel and diming themselves, right? Communities have been taxing themselves in the form of parcel taxes, of sales taxes. Um, and all of this has been in an effort to replace the huge loss of funding that we lost as a result of Prop 13, right? So when you look at, uh, you know, what, one of the big uh, causes to the loss of uh, funding at the local level, Prop 13 is one of the biggest ones. Um, because we lost significant revenue at the local level from property taxes. And so when we think about some of what are some of the revenue measures that are being discussed, I think people are now thinking about what are some creative solutions that maybe previously were considered third rail options, options that we, we didn't want to touch. Now we're saying everything's on the table. We know that we need to raise revenue for California. We can't, you know, we can't stick to these notions that this is the third rail, it's untouchable, everything has to be back in the table. That's why we're seeing people talk about single pairs in a way that was not talked about before. And uh, there was actually a bill introduced by Lada and Atkins uh, legislatively. Um, that's why there's been significant organizing happening around Prop 13 reform. Um, and when we think about um, raising revenue for California, that could raise up to $9 billion for California. And so um, Chris mentioned- property tax. Uh, and this is taxing commercial properties and leaving residential properties alone. And so Chris mentioned earlier, how are we going to fill the gap? And he said, you know, the gap would be uh, in, in the loss of federal funding around ACA could be anywhere from five to five to ten billion dollars. And so I think we need to think about a number of creative solutions. And I do think we need to go back and look at uh, revenue proposals like Prop 13 reform as one of them. Um, and then um, I know that there is a coalition of organizations called Make It Fair. Uh, and there will be a bill that will be introduced legislatively by Senator Skinner and Senator Mitchell uh, this year legislatively to reform Prop 13, specifically the commercial property side of it. Great. Um, anybody else want to weigh in on the revenue? Uh, one, one thing that I uh, have been um, just reading a little bit more about is looking at local tax revenues as well. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I also was just blown away by some of the, um, the voter data from November. Um, the national scene obviously was what it was, but the LA voter data was impressively um, high in terms of um, voters' willingness to sort of dig deep and think about what they're willing to pay for to ensure that we actually have um, a high-functioning society locally. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting, though, is there there are still some structural challenges on local initiatives. So um, I, I was just at a convening. Um, there were four local initiatives on the ballot across the state um, in Sacramento and Marin uh, in the Vallejo area um, and one other. Um, and it was they were local children's initiatives for uh, programs for 0 to 24. Um, and all of them did not pass which is really interesting, even in a high water mark of voter turnout in a presidential election. What, what I think um, many of the folks who were participants in those local initiative campaigns uh, were taking away from that is that the 67% threshold is really quite um, challenging. And <laughs> that even, even for non-substantial reasons, um, the, the Marin folks were talking about how their initiative was um, somewhat um, randomly coupled with an idea of housing population density, which had nothing to do with the campaign, but there were enough just sort of uh, posters put up. Essentially, it was a smear campaign, right? Um, connecting one issue with another one that is unpopular in Marin, um, enough to bring it just to 66%. Um, and so one of the things I, I've also been hearing some interesting conversation about is lowering the threshold for local initiatives um, in the K-12 world, when school bonds were required to get 67%, they did not pass when they were brought down to 55%. Um, we have seen record numbers of school bonds being approved by local voters, um, and, and we've seen schools being built. Um, so we know there's a model that works. I think there's a new bill that just is going to be introduced, bringing right. it down. Um, 5%. I, I think it was Right. It 
does seem as if that, I mean, it's obvious that would help a lot mm -hmm. to not have to hit that 67%. But um, anything else on the revenue end? I think it'll be, to me, it'll be interesting to see if the, uh, if people's kind of fear and um, overall sense of um, fear, really, which is the governing principle of this new administration at a federal level, if it affects, if it trickles down and really affects people's willingness to tax themselves. I think there could be a kind of a conservative impulse on this. Um, hopefully, it'll be delayed. We can have a few cycles where we can raise some taxes. Um, well, that, that's a good point. I mean, we still haven't seen uh, President Trump's tax package, right? So we have. So we we've been hearing tax cuts for the rich. We've been hearing estate, corporate, tax, corporate cuts. tax cuts. We've also been hearing subsidies for corporations, and so. I'm just wondering how all this is going to play out. So on one hand, we're cutting all of these services and programs to the poor, and then now we're talking about giving all these subsidies and tax cuts for major corporations. So at some point, this is all going to turn into a big, giant mess. And I wonder how huge the outrage is going to be even at, at that point. So we're already seeing outrage in communities across the state around the Affordable Care Act. So what's going to happen when he starts to phase in? Because we, we've heard uh, that that's part of the plan, right? So what's going to happen? When, because we are going to see a widening gap between the rich and the poor. So what is going to happen at that point? So I'm just curious. I mean, I, I've also been watching it, and I'm wondering, OK, what what will be the results of this? But uh, you know, will that be an opportunity for us? Will this be, present a crucial moment for us to then really start thinking about you know what we can do in California to build power around some of these progressive solutions that people have said in the past were untouchable, but maybe now sound more reasonable? Yeah, I think so. I don't know the numbers yet because I don't think we've seen his the real tax plan. He says it's coming next month. Uh, it's like a barrage, one thing after another. It's dizzying. But I did see the numbers on the proposed tax cuts if they do away with the funding mechanisms, the redistributive funding mechanisms for the ACA. And the top ten, one tenth of one percent would get an average of seven million dollars back, and the top one percent would get an average of one hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars back. And average people would pay five to ten thousand dollars more. I mean, it is uh, that let alone the people who are going to lose insurance completely. And that's just the taxing mechanisms. That's not if they get rid of the whole darn thing and start all over again, which they're not going to be able to. But it's, it's really outrageous. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so outrageous. So we'll see if the uh, kind of populist fervor that um, mistakenly brought us this president that um, we saw fueling the Bernie Sanders campaign, that we've seen, I think, the values, the collective California values emerging of equity or, a, you know, equity and inclusion, fairness, if it does translate into some revenue proposals. I would like to think that it would and that the organizations that you guys work with and are involved with, if you haven't joined the Make It Fair uh, mm -hmm. coalition, now would be a really good time. Um, and and beyond that, whatever other um, solutions come on the revenue side, I think we're finally beginning to see a willingness to tax ourselves uh, and out of perhaps desperation, but um, I think it's a really good thing. Um, I'm also interested in the response to. You started to talk, Kim, about the uh, response in first five to basically the governor going back on uh, his his promise. What are you doing about it? So, um, as, as Chris mentioned, we are early in the budget season. The um, the hearings begin in earnest in a couple of weeks, um, but the the initial response has been um, quite quite strong with the legislature, actually. The Senate um, issued a statement, um, and Holly Mitchell, who has been a champion on early childhood, has also um, been, uh, I think, quite vocal on this issue that um, last year's deal needs to, in fact, stand. 
Um, the assembly has also issued a um, similar statement. And so our job in the advocacy community is to make sure that every legislature, member of the legislature, hears that message consistently, regularly, in local meetings here in LA, as well as in Sacramento. So we've, we've done a number of advocacy days already um, that will certainly, I think, get amped up as the budget season goes on. But it's also a, a matter, I think, of um, sometimes getting out of the way um, of policymakers actually hearing directly from their constituents. Um, so uh, First Five LA has a 14 investments in community capacity building um, in the Best Start communities, um, and we've been interviewing um, parents, family members, caregivers on the ground to actually represent their stories. Not everyone can travel to Sacramento, but it is it is far more persuasive for a legislator to hear directly from one of their constituents. Um, this is how that proposal hurts my family. Um, and that is a powerful message that is best conveyed in the first person. Um, we've also got a media strategy to ensure that this is part of the surround sound that legislators are hearing, that it's not just a couple of isolated um, organizations and individuals, um, but something that is getting picked up in the press. Um, in fact, many of you might have seen um, a story also in LA Times a couple weeks back um, about the impacts of the minimum wage in terms of eligibility, where we are now in this strange um, land where a, a two-parent family working minimum wage jobs um, at full time are considered too rich under existing law to actually have child care support. Um, and so what we're hearing is um, scores of parents who are reaching out saying, how, how can this be that this is um, something that gets me kicked out of eligibility so I can no longer choose between being um, a, a working parent versus being a parent at all? Um, and so there's a lot around sharing stories and also building coalitions with people who not only are providing services and not only receiving services, but working with the business community, working with higher ed um, to make sure that it is Round sound is from the whole host of, of allies who care about this issue. Yeah, we just had a meeting in um, Supervisor Kuehl's office where we <clears throat> talked about all of the programs and that are affected by the rising minimum wage, the eligibility yeah. criteria, because it's sort of like, you know, you, you do one good thing and then you've got to catch up with the rest of the economic policies or we've got to look at all the eligibility criteria because we're suddenly, you know, people are not going to be no longer going to be eligible for a bunch of uh, you know support and we got to figure that out um, I'm wondering if you have questions for folks yes Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Fair one. laughs> we have been seeing a move um, to tax what are called the sin taxes right so so we have been seeing a move so we saw in November that there was a statewide measure that uh, proposition 56 tobacco tax, um, and the majority of that money actually went to um, help fund Medi-Cal, and so that, and I think it raised the tax, the uh, cigarette box by, I can't remember, $2, $2, tax, $2 a tax. So um, so we have been seeing a move, and then it's in the Bay Area, there was a soda tax that, that happened, and so we have been seeing a move more and more of these types of taxes. Now, one thing to keep in mind um, is that uh, many people have said, well, these are regressive tax taxes, so when you think about who are consumers of uh, tobacco, or who are consumers of soda, who are consumers of alcohol. Uh, in large proportions, um, uh, we see uh, many low-income families that are consumers. And so I know with tobacco tax, um, uh, you know, people saw, well, the money's going to go to Medi-Cal, and so they saw that as a benefit. People also saw that um, the tobacco industries had been targeting um, low-income communities, young people, right, in low-income communities, um, and so people really saw this as a way to curb um, uh, future addictions. And so I think, you know, I've, I say everything's on the table. I did say that, and then, but I think we need to think about, like, what's, you know, what are some progressive tax options, right, and then, and how do we, that we can pursue, and how do we avoid some of the regressive tax options, because we don't want to further impact um, in a negative way, you know, low-income families and communities. And so I think we just need to think about that. And, uh, so I'm not taking a position either way, um, but I'm just letting you know, like, some of the things for us to be considering as, as, uh, as we do think about uh, STEM taxes and going forward, what are some opportunities? 
I do want to just talk for a minute about marijuana because there's been a lot of conversation at the county um, about marijuana and a marijuana tax. And actually, it's been very interesting. The um, CEO's office has put together a whole team representing every department that would be involved with marijuana from public health to public safety, the sheriffs to, uh, you know, the tax, the treasurer. And they've been to Denver several times, to Colorado, been to Oregon, other um, states that have, have worked with it. And it's actually very interesting. It's kind of fascinating and daunting. And in fact, what we discussed, because we thought, you know, it's going to be like the cash cow. We're going to be mm -hmm. able to figure out how to tax it. It'll cover some of our, mm -hmm. our funding. We'll be able to expand services. Uh, I'm sure the state of California has been thinking the same thing. Now, first of all, of course, we have to deal with the fact that the president is talking about coming down hard on the 20 states that have legalized it. We don't know what that would look like. Um, there, second of all, there's all kinds of interesting challenges with marijuana. It's a cash-only business. Um, the federally regulated banks can't touch the money. So you have the possibility maybe of a county bank. We've actually talked about creating a county bank so that we can basically recycle <laughs> dollars into public services. Oh. Um, right now in Colorado, by the way, just in case you're interested, a little fun fact, Brinks, you know the guys that pick up the cash from businesses, are, are doing the banking for the state of Colorado because you can't use any of the federally uh, regulated banks, right? So it's, they've had to, the states and people have got, had to get very creative about it. But here's the fact. The truth is that there are a lot of public health uh, um, challenges to marijuana. Uh, there, so we're going to be putting out a lot of money before we see any money at the county level. Uh, we're going to have to be figuring out um, how to regulate it and be spending a lot of money. So I don't think that marijuana is going to be the income stream that people think it's going to be. Um, I do think down the line uh, there will be some funding in it for public services at the state level, at the, at the cities that choose to uh, tax it, and at the county level. But it's also going to cost us a lot of money. So don't think it's just um, uh, a cash cow, but it's really been interesting. So other questions? Yes? Can, can I just make a distinction? So there's, there's regressive taxes and then I think sin taxes are a particular variety of regressive tax. So there's regressive taxes like the sales tax, which um, mean that if you, um, you know, buy toilet paper um, and that, you know, whatever your household sundry items are, it's a bigger chunk of your um, income as a lower income person. And so that that's one form of regressiveness, which is, is really like there's the tax and then there's like an additional tax for being poor and for more of your your income being dedicated to that. Progressive sin taxes, I do think, are a different category of taxes because part of, of the um, disincentive for using them is intentional, right? It is meant to disincentivize additional soda consumption, alcohol consumption, um, tobacco consumption, because there are costs that are disproportionately borne by low-income communities. Um, and, and so there's in some ways, I feel like that makes it a, an easier category of regressive um, tax to deal with that, that is about disincentivizing behavior that's bad for people. Mm -hmm. But then look what happens the first five when people stop smoking. Yes, and, and, and it's totally, we do have declining revenue, but it is, um, it is a good problem to have, and it is a good push to be more creative in our revenue sources. Um, it is also, I, I think of this turn of phrase as these are high class problems, right? When you are, you are actually affecting the goal that you sought out to have, which is um, that people are smoking less. And so um, then you can tax it at a greater degree. It used to be 50 cents a pack, and now that it's going to go up $2 a pack, I, I think that is a step in the right direction. But it also underscores the urgency of why we need to think about other um, taxing revenues to actually affect the broader goals.
Yes, I mean, I personally favor extending the sales tax to services. I think it's ridiculous that we don't, uh, since we're a service economy. Uh, it isn't just things, things that are bought and sold. But uh, I think the whole conversation is one on revenues, on taxation, on what, you know, all of it needs to be a much broader conversation if we're going to continue to increase the budget. We're going to have to bring in more revenue. We're going to have to look at the taxes. And, you know, it's really outrageous that California is the only oil producing company that, uh, state out of 17 states that doesn't have an oil severance tax. Mm -hmm. I understand there's other corporate taxes that the oil companies pay and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> but the reality is if Alaska can tax them $25 a barrel, why the heck can't we do something, uh, even half of that or a third of that like Texas does? It's really ridiculous. Um, and I think that the stranglehold that oil and some of the other industries have had on the legislature and frankly, continue to, um, because they fund the campaigns of some of the folks. And unfortunately, it's sometimes folks who come from in low-income communities who don't have access to other funding who end up uh, being funded by some of these big money interests. And I, I think all of it needs to be on the table in a, in a very frank conversation about, now that we kind of see where California's values are, uh, in a broad sense, uh, we need to look at, at taxing in a way that uh, enhances it. I saw a hand, oh yes, I'd like to know what you're thinking. What would an idea be of running, I mean, somebody has to be responsible for helping disabled and senior poor folks who need help. So what would your proposal be? Interesting. Anybody have any thoughts about that? I, I, I think you know, working or correct. <laughs> no, go ahead. I, I was just going to say I think the the quest for efficiency is 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 absolutely one that everyone shares, right? Mm -hmm. the, the idea that um, that we need to be learning machines ourselves, <laughs> right? That that um, if the, the example that comes to mind is. Um, North Carolina invested heavily in pre-K programs for its lower, lowest income children. By fifth grade, 40% of their low income children that were previously misdiagnosed and put in special ed programs were not in special ed. That is a cost savings. It, it requires a longer time horizon than a single election cycle, but that, that is absolutely an efficiency that I'm deeply interested in capturing. It's the difference of paying for one or two years at the outset for prevention costs versus paying twice the amount of the average um, school spending for K to 12 for 13 years. No. For us, um, and I know Greg, <laughs> um, it's it's a valid point, and it's something that you definitely you know we're looking at. Um, I think one of our challenges is trying to get the state on board which has been um, a slow progress. I don't dispute, I totally agree that the levels we have currently for basically all of our pro uh, programs, whether it be the federal poverty levels or income levels or even our, um, what we call our asset levels, which is the property levels, that impacts right now our aged and disabled population haven't been raised in almost it was like 1984, if I remember correctly. Um, and that's been one of the things that we've been talking to the state. I've been in, in, I've been in Medi-Cal for at least 18 years and with IHSS for the last four. And that's been one of the questions we've always posed to the state. And instead of uh, looking at the program holistically and seeing what can we do better, like you said, to um, assist that population that, yes, we're old aging every day, I feel it. <laughs> um, it. You know, instead of doing that and seeing what would be the best way to approach this to get a really good comprehensive solution, we just get, oh, they created a new program. And that only helps you with this tiny little bit of the population that may actually fit into that criteria. And you're looking at something for more, not less. And our challenge is consistently our state. Unfortunately, 
when they get a new legislation and they pass it and it's incorporated and it creates a new program, they look at the most basic of uh, situations and go from there versus looking at it like a little more and to say, because what happens in LA, you can't compare it to what happens in Lake County. And unfortunately, the state puts it at equal for all, and it's really not. So it, it is a challenge. It's something we consistently look at. Um, I don't have a solution either. <laughs> but it's something that we continue to work with the state to try to get them to understand where we're coming from. One more comment or question, and then we're going to just do like closing a couple minutes each. Yes. I think I would dispute your basic premise. Um, I actually think that the, I worked um, as a deputy mayor for Antonio Villarigosa, so I've worked at the city. And most of my life I've worked in the nonprofit sector, so that I am entirely familiar with. But I have two government experiences, one uh, in, in City Hall on the mayor's side, uh, so I'm aware of a charter that has an independent legislative body, the city council, and an executive branch, the governor, and, has, and sort of has a weak mayor, strong council system, and now the county board of supervisors, where you have five people responsible for both the executive function and the legislative function. It's a very, very powerful job, and I actually think that, uh, with all due respect to the naysayers, um, that it, it functions very well. Uh, to have a CEO who is very strong and in a sense the sixth supervisor. Um, as long as you have, now I don't know any previous ones because I just came in with Supervisor Kuehl. So I, I mean I, you know, I've met David Jansen and I've met Bill Fujioka and knew him at the city, but I actually think that it functions extremely well if you have really good elected uh, folks in there. So from my point of view, as somebody who cares about equity and justice and transforming the criminal justice system and bringing more economic justice in, I'm very happy with a supermajority of women, let's start with that, uh, and a supermajority of progressives because the, the, the values that Supervisor Kuehl has of continuing to reform the criminal justice system, of giving more people a chance uh, and, and expanding, kind of redistributing power and economic opportunity, uh, which is what I think the job of government is, if you're from a progressive point of view, is going very well. So I don't agree with your premise. I think that the county is functioning extremely well. The problem in Los Angeles is you have LAUSD and how many other school districts? And you have a county of 10 million people and you have a county government that has a $30 billion budget, LAUSD has a $20 billion budget, LA City has a $9 billion budget and they don't work and then there's 88, 87 other cities besides LA City. Uh, and however many 81 school districts or something, I don't want to leave anybody out, but it's the most decentralized government, local government, uh, and it's, it's just crazy. So trying to do anything together, collaboratively, uh, I've worked on homelessness for many years, and it's been, you know, it's an ongoing struggle, not just because we keep ha having more people fall into homelessness because of the affordable housing crisis, um, but just trying to get governments to work together when the count when cities build housing and counties do health and human services, uh, and that's the simplest example of these massive social problems that you have to work collaboratively um, on. But anyway, uh, so you know, pe people criticize government. It's really easy to criticize government, especially after 30 years of attacks on government uh, that have. Uh, you know, defunded local government. I mean, we wouldn't be in this situation if Prop 13 hadn't passed. I'm just saying, we would be in an entirely, in California, we would be in an entirely different economic situation if, if it had not passed in 1979. Um, it defunded the schools and it defunded local government. Um, and it's made, you know, horrible Sophie's choices. Do you fund fire or do you fund police? Let alone do you fund libraries 
where do you fund you know early childhood? Uh, anyway, I'm digressing. So we're we're out of town <laughs> at time, and I wanted to see if everybody wants to just take a minute and wrap up maybe just one final thing you'd like to say about the budget, the impact of the budget, revenues, or anything else you'd like to say in this crazy time. For me, um, you know, the budget obviously is going to impact my department, but if and when until it does, um, one of the things that I want to point out or at least want to continue to push out and promote and for all of you to just to assist our communities is that until that time happens, people are still entitled to certain benefits. I know like um, it was said, there is fear in the community. There is uh, misunderstanding at this point. Um, I, you know, would just remind all of you that everyone's entitled to those benefits until we hear otherwise. So I really want to push that. We did hear, um, for my department so far, we're monitoring really closely um, to see the application levels and also just the data as to do we see a downward trend, you know, just because of what's being heard out there. So far we haven't seen it, so that's the good news. But we had a couple of individuals call our department and say, I don't want the services, please close my case. Mm -hmm. we've, we've talked to them, um, thankfully it was only a handful, but we've talked to them and say, you, you know, until we know more, you are entitled to these benefits. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to convince most, there were still a few that said, no, I, I want to just close my case. And we have to obviously do what's said. But I do want everyone to remind those constituents to those residents that you're entitled to these benefits. So if you have that need, whether it's for the cash assistance, whether it's for the CalFresh benefits or food stamps as they're known, whether it's for Medi-Cal and health assistance as well as IHSS, until differently, these are benefits where they're to, to apply. <laughs> Well, I just want to thank you all for inviting me again and uh, for uh, giving us your undivided attention. Um, and then I guess just to wrap up, just just to know, and we started talking, I started by talking about this a little bit, you know, change is happening, right? We, we see change happening. Um, I'm inspired by the number of people that are out there um, protesting, resisting in many different ways, and, and many people are doing this for the first time, and I think this is a very exciting moment for us. Um, we're in a very special time now. Um, and so I just, um, you know, recommend for all of you to figure out a way, what's your, you figure, find your space for how to get involved. Find your space for how to stay active. Um, I think it's really exciting when we see legislators in California standing up for immigrant communities, uh, standing up for the rights of uh, many vulnerable populations in California. Let's do what we can to support them so that they can continue to be champions for us on a number of issues. But at the same time, let's not be afraid to push them when they're putting out budgets that are not benefiting or not helping the most vulnerable people in our communities. So, so let's not be afraid to use both resources when we need to use them. Um, I, I was just thinking about um, sort of I, I imagine most people thought about election night as a particularly pivotal moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, wherever you are on the political spectrum, but the, the sticking point for me is that there were, there were millions of children and families who live in poverty um, in California and are facing a whole host of challenges. And whether Hillary would have been elected or given that Donald was elected, they are still living in poverty and they are still our neighbors and members of our community. Um, and so what that, that really underscores to me is this idea is we can't afford to be overwhelmed by the constant barrage of tweets and everything else coming out of Washington. It actually really punctuates the need and the urgency of us to actually focus on what we can do here because there is so much still happening in our budget process right here, right now. Um, and it doesn't at all give us a path to not watch that budget and make sure that we actually push for our values. Well said. And thanks to Chris Haney and the California Budget Policy Center for all of your